The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in the Gospel according to St. John, in the first chapter, reading verses 26 and 33. Verses 26 and 33 in the first chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And the subject we are dealing with, as most of you remember, is this great matter of the baptism with the Holy Ghost. This, I'm trying to show, is what enables us as Christian people to represent our blessed Lord and Savior and God, our everlasting Father, in this world of sin and of time and of shame. And this we are concerned about because we believe that this is the supreme need of the world this morning, the supreme need of every individual, the only hope for the world at large. We are living in a world which is full of trouble, full of confusion, full of sin and of shame, a world which has been trying to deal with and to solve its own problems throughout the centuries, but which is no nearer to solving them than it was at the beginning, a world which we believe according to the teaching of this book, is under the wrath of God. A world which has turned away from God and brought down calamity and trouble upon itself. Its only hope is in this gospel. And Christians are people who are called of God, not only out of that world into his kingdom, but are meant to be his representatives. Endless Statements to that effect can be found everywhere in the Bible. The children of Israel, the Jews, were God's people. They were given the oracles of God. God gave the revelation to them in order that he might represent, they might represent him before the nations of the world. And that is true of the Christian. That is the business of the church. To tell the world, as it is, of this great and glorious salvation which is in Christ Jesus. He is the only hope of the world. There's no hope in men. The only hope is in the Son of God. And our business is to represent him, to glorify him amongst the people of the world, to magnify his name, to show them the excellences of his person and of his great salvation. That's our business. We alone do that in this world. Nobody else does that but the Christian church. This is the unique business of the Christian church, to preach Christ and him crucified as the only hope, the only savior of the world, to declare that there is none other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. And Christian people alone have that message, and they alone can present it to the world. The world doesn't know it. It doesn't believe it. That's the cause of its trouble. So we are called uniquely to bear witness to him, to magnify him. But the question is, how can we do that? We are aware of the facts concerning him. But he himself has taught that that's not sufficient. He tells even these trained apostles, disciples of his who have been with him throughout his earthly ministry and had seen his death and burial were witnesses of his resurrection with their naked eyes he tells them, tarry in Jerusalem until he be endued with power from on high. And on the day of Pentecost, he sent that power upon them in a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so, we are trying to show that the central main object of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is to enable us with power to be witnesses unto him, his person, his work. And therefore, there is nothing more important at the present hour than that we should understand this teaching. Hence the time we are giving to it. Now, we've, been, we've come to the point at which we are considering what are the evidences 
uh, of this baptism with the Spirit, and I've divided them into two main categories, those which are more or less internal and subjective, known mainly to the man or woman himself or herself, and those which are more objective in their character. And obviously, these objective ones uh, are of great importance, of vital importance in this whole matter of witness and of testimony. So, we are dealing with them at the moment, and I have suggested some such things as this, that one of the objective results of the baptism of the Spirit is at times seen even in a person's facial appearance, a kind of transfiguration, some reflection of the glory of God, as the face of Moses shined when he came down from the mountain, having been with God. So, there is something of this in the Christian. We all, says Paul, in 2 Corinthians 3:18, we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even by the Lord the Spirit. Well, we've dealt with that. And then we've come to this point when we're dealing with it as it shows itself in speech. And the great first characteristic here is the power and the ability that is given. Not only in preaching, but in ordinary conversation and in prayer. There are still people, I find, who seem to think that what we're talking about is only for certain special people. I try every Sunday morning to point out that that is a complete fallacy, that the New Testament offers this to all and indicates clearly that this is possible to all. I hope that that is now clear once and forever. This is not only for certain special people. There is no such teaching here. The promise is to you and to your children and to as many as are afar off. And not only that, I have tried as best I can to give you illustrations which show that ordinary unknown people can know this glorious experience even as outstanding and distinguished people can. I ended last Sunday morning by reporting to you something within my own experience in the case of one of the most ordinary men I have ever known. Pray, my dear friends, that the Holy Spirit will give you power to concentrate and to listen. I went out of my way to end last Sunday morning with this ordinary man, yet I had a letter from somebody who said, is this only for certain special people? Pray that you may be given grace to listen. The devil would rob us of the most glorious aspects of the Christian faith. Let us therefore concentrate with all our powers, lest he rob us of something that God is offering to us. Very well having dealt in that way with this power that comes in speech, in all forms, and in prayer, I would go on to emphasize something else which is obvious, and that is the note of authority. Now, this, of course, was the thing that struck people about our blessed Lord himself. Though he was a carpenter, and though he was, as judged by the world, a mere nobody, yet when he begins to speak, they're struck at once, by the way in which his teaching differs from that of the Pharisees and scribes. They said, this man speaketh and teacheth with authority, not as the Pharisees and scribes. And that was the great characteristic of his ministry. But don't forget, he was not able, even he, the Son of God incarnate, was not able to commence his ministry until he had been baptized with the Spirit at his baptism with water in the Jordan by John the Baptist. That's why John puts it here. John had been told, He that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him. He. The same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And you remember, when our Lord went back after that uh, to his hometown of Nazareth and went into the to the synagogue on the Sunday and was given the book to read and he began to speak. The passage which he read was that famous passage from Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, which reads like this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Well, the anointing took place when the Holy Ghost descended upon him in the form of a dove in the baptism of in Jordan at the hands of John the Baptist. And from that moment, this authority came out. 
And it was evident to all. Well, now this again is something that was equally clear and evident in the apostles after their baptism of the Spirit. The contrast in the case of Peter is so striking. You read his sermon on the day of Pentecost as recorded in the second chapter of the book of Acts and you're struck by the authority with which he spoke and commanded that congregation and expounded the scriptures. No hesitation, no fumbling. The men who were the other disciples, uh, you remember, couldn't even believe the report about the resurrection. You read the last chapter of Luke's Gospel, and you'll find that when the women who'd gone early to the tomb came back and reported to these very disciples and apostles the fact that they had found the grave to be empty, we are told their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not, and they were muddled in their own understanding of the Old Testament Scriptures. But here is a man speaking, expounding the Scriptures with authority. This is always one of the results of the baptism with the Spirit. And you get exactly the same thing in the case of the Apostle Paul. It, there are such endless examples of this that one scarcely knows where to quote and where not to quote. Let me give you one example concerning the Apostle Paul in the 13th chapter of this book, of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. We find this happening in Cyprus. Paul began to preach and the chief men of the Ireland was listening to him, but um, he had uh, another man with him called Elymas the sorcerer. Sergius Paulus, the prudent man, the governor, was very ready to listen. But Elymas the sorcerer withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost. Now that was, that was something that happened at that moment to him. It doesn't mean that he was always filled with the Holy Ghost. He was given special authority and power. You'll find that being repeated right through the book of the Acts of the Apostles. We are told of the disciples and others, they were filled with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Then, you remember how in chapter 4, when they'd been on trial and were straightly charged not to preach nor to teach any more in the name of Jesus, threatened with extermination, they go back and uh, they pray to God and God again sends the Spirit upon them. They're filled again. And Paul here was given a special filling, another baptism, if you like, of power and authority. So you read this. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Now, there, you see, is the authority. There's no hesitation. The apostle knew. And all these men always knew. They had this authority in speech. They had this authority in performing miracles. It's always a characteristic. And as you read again the subsequent history of the church, you will find that this is the thing that always characterizes these people. This authority. You get it in every revival. You get it in great reformations. What was it that enabled Martin Luther to stand alone? Alone against 15 centuries of tradition, with all the authorities against him. To stand alone and say, here I stand. I can do no other, so help me God. That's the authority. And it's characterized, I say, all men always who have received the baptism of the Spirit. And this authority is not only, I say again, in public declaration. The same authority is evident about people who know these things. They've got this assurance and it always leads to this authority. The last thing I mention under this heading is, of course, boldness and fearlessness. And this is very striking. Again, seen perhaps most perfectly of all in the instance of the Apostle Peter himself. Peter was, of course, by nature a very bold and impulsive man, at least impulsive, if not bold. He was, he had a kind of boldness, but he was a good deal of a braggart, as natural boldness often leads to. But there he was, and yet you remember when our Lord was taken captive and set on trial, and the serving maid recognized Peter and said, you were one of them, you were with this Galilean. 
Peter, you remember, denied him. He denied him three times. Why? Well, he was afraid. He was a coward. He was trying to save his own skin. He didn't want to be put to death. So he denies his Lord, whom he'd heard and whom he'd seen performing these mighty miracles. He denies him in order to save his own life. And yet, the moment he's baptized with the Spirit, you see him, as I say, standing up and addressing that crowd at Jerusalem with fearlessness, boldness, charging them with sin, bringing the message home to them, afraid of no one and of nothing. What a contrast. And you remember how, uh, when he was himself on trial, the thing he was so afraid of before the baptism of the Spirit, when he was himself on trial, uh, you read it at the beginning of the book of the Acts of the Apostles, we are told that the authorities laid hands on Peter and John and put them in hold unto the next day. And here they are on trial. And we read in verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, now, that was another endowment. That was something special. The Spirit came upon him again with unusual power. Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, You rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent men, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel. That by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you hold. Boldness, fearlessness, who are these authorities? This is what the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost does to a man, and you get the same thing later on in the same chapter. When again... They commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Now this is obviously one of the great characteristics of the baptism of the Spirit. It gives this boldness and fearlessness. Let me give you one other example, because, my dear friends, if you are not thrilled by this kind of thing, and if you don't feel that there's something wrong with you, that you know nothing about this quality, well, then I say we are almost beyond hope. Listen again. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, and then before the court again, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Well, there it is in the scripture and in the long annals of the Christian church. Is there anything comparable to the way in which the saints of God have been given this same boldness and fearlessness? We know of some of the great notable examples. And for myself, these are the things in which I glory. These heroes of the Christian faith, defying kings, emperors, princes, the great ones of the world, and speaking the truth of God and the truth concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, think of those early martyrs and confessors. Think of those men who were not afraid of a Nero. They wouldn't be subjugated and subdued. They defied him and were ready to be cast to the lions in the arena, praising God that at last they'd been accounted worthy to suffer for his name's sake. And down the ages they come, these glorious men, standing up, fighting, defying the lion's gory mane and every principality and power. All honor to the heroes of God's kingdom, these imperishable names. But let's not forget this. Amongst them were large numbers of ordinary, common people. As Gray puts it in the great elegy, some unknown Hamden some village Hamden, some unknown Milton. Nobody knows their names. But there have been ordinary men and women who have had to do this very thing. 
They have been threatened with losing their work, turned out of their homes where they and their ancestors had lived in a cottage for centuries, turned out for one reason only, that they'd become Puritans or Methodists or something like that, and before they're Protestants. Now the annals of the church are full of this sort of thing. We don't know their names, but we know of them, the common people. And this, I say, has been one of the most glorious things in the long history of the Christian church. Boldness, fearlessness, not foolhardiness, remember, not being ridiculous, but always being ready to give a reason for the hope that is in you, with confidence, with assurance, not allowing yourself to be intimidated by any earthly human power. But your loyalty is to him, and you've been given such a knowledge of him and his love to you that you're ready to declare it with boldness and fearlessness, whatever the consequences may be. And we are living in an age in which this is still being done. We thank God in our prayer for the martyrs in the Congo, and many of them did this very thing. It was their boldness, their fearlessness, that was such an offense to the others. And there are endless illustrations which one could give. I've known people myself. I remember two friends oh, back uh, about 1928 uh, who'd passed through an experience like this with the communists in China, threatened with death. And I'll never forget it as long as I live, hearing uh, a certain man and his wife, who had been in that very position, Mr. and Mrs. Porteous, how they told that with the guns facing them, they just asked if they might be allowed to sing and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace and how that was used of God uh, to lead to their release and their being set free. Well now, here are some, you see, of these external signs and they're clear and obvious to all. I've taken you through them in order that we all may examine ourselves and ask the question, is there something about me? that has this impression upon men and women. I'm a Christian as these people were Christians. Is there that about me which is having this impression, making this impact, leading men and women to consider these matters? Those then are some of these external signs and results of the baptism of the Spirit. Now I come to another division of this great matter. And uh, I'm free to confess that it is, beyond any question, the most difficult aspect of the whole subject. And yet, one's got to deal with it. It's in the Scriptures. And so, we come to it. The whole question of the gifts that result from the baptism of the Spirit in various ways. This is difficult, mainly because it's controversial. It has certain inherent difficulties. And the difficulties often arise because of our ignorance of the spiritual realm. But at this present moment, this is a very important matter. Important for two main reasons. One, that we need some supernatural, superhuman authentication of our message. And the second is because of the dangers attending it because of the enemy who can counterfeit to such an extent as to deceive even the very elect themselves, according to our Lord and Savior. It's his own teaching, it's his own warning in Matthew 24. He says they shall work signs and wonders, lying signs and wonders, which are so clever and subtle as almost to deceive the very elect themselves. Well then, there are those two main reasons why we must of necessity face honestly in the light of Scripture this all-important subject. Now take that first point I made. Is it not becoming clear to everybody, at least it should be, that the Christian church is failing and failing lamentably today? Isn't it obvious to us that it isn't enough even to be orthodox? You must be orthodox, otherwise you haven't got a message. People are not going to listen to our speculations. They can speculate themselves. People want a word of authority. That's always been the case, and they will always recognize authority, as I've shown you. We need authority. We need some authentication. It isn't enough merely that we state these things and demonstrate them and put them logically. All that is essential, but it isn't enough. 
Is it not clear that we are living in an age when we need some special authentication? That's the need for revival. Indeed, not only are we confronted by materialism, a worldliness, an indifference, a hardness, a callousness. Increasingly one is hearing of and reading in the newspapers of certain manifestations of the powers of evil. It isn't merely sin that's constituting a problem in this country today. Have you read about the recrudescence of black magic and devil worship and things like that? This drug taking and some of the things it leads to. We are living in a society in which there are increasing evidences and manifestations of the power of evil spirits. Well, there I say, you have what constitutes again perhaps the most urgent need of some manifestation, some demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. So, we are concerned about it for these two main reasons. Now, obviously, in the New Testament, and indeed in the whole of the Bible, we are taught that uh, the baptism of the Spirit is attended by uh, certain gifts. Joel, in his prophecy, quoted by Peter on the day of Pentecost, he foretells this. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and so on, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. On my servants and on my handmaidens will I pour out of in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, and so on. Very well, Joel and the other prophets, you'll get it in the other prophets as well, they, they always indicate that in this age which was to come, and which came with the Lord Jesus Christ and the baptism of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, that there should be some unusual authentication of the message. And as we saw in the reading this morning from the 14th chapter of this Gospel according to St. John, our Lord himself prophesied this. You remember how he reasons with the unbelieving. He says, uh, if you don't believe me, if you don't believe my words. Well, then he said, believe me for the very work's sake. His miracles were signs, as we know. That's the word, the term that is used in the Gospel of John with respect to them. The miracles were not merely done as acts of kindness. The main reason for the miracles was that they should be signs, authentication of who and exactly he was. Now, our Lord makes use of that, he says. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. And then he goes on. I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now, our Lord was constantly using this very argument. You remember how he used it when John the Baptist sent two of his disciples unto him, asking, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Matthew 11, 3 to 6. Very well then, it's clear from all this teaching leading up to the book of the Acts of the Apostles that this was to be expected. And the moment you come to the book of the Acts of the Apostles itself, well, there you find the evidence in great profusion. At once it begins. Cloven tongues as a fire, a visible sign. Miracles of various descriptions. Prophetic utterances, and so on. People described as having this gift of prophecy and of prophetic utterance, and so on. It runs right through the whole of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. But what is interesting is that it isn't confined to the book of the Acts of the Apostles. You get exactly the same thing taught in the various epistles. Take, for instance, the famous passage in 1 Corinthians from chapter 12 right to the end of chapter 14. Chapters 12, 13, and 14 of the first epistle to the Corinthians deal exclusively with this 
great matter, showing that in the church at Corinth, as in all the other churches, this kind of thing was taking place, and so the apostle has to deal with the, the situation. And indeed, in writing the second epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 12, verse 12, where his whole question, the whole question of his being an apostle has been raised by certain enemies and detractors, he turns and says, Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. The apostle's ministry was authenticated in that way. And then you will remember how many weeks back I quoted to you from the epistle to the Galatians, chapter 3, verses 2 and 5. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? And then in verse 5, He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Now, the Apostle says, The Spirit came upon you because you had believed by faith. It is to believers that the Spirit is given in this way in baptism. And the result was that there was one working, that God ministered the Spirit to them, and miracles were being worked among them. And the Apostle uses the same argument in that respect. And then let me give you a final illustration of what I'm trying to show in Hebrews 2 and in verse 4. He talks about the Gospel which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also, bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Now, I'm simply trying to establish this point. That it is perfectly clear that in the New Testament times, the gospel was authenticated in this way by the signs and wonders and miracles of various characters and description. And you can't begin to understand the New Testament, the epistles, as well as the book of the Acts of the Apostles, without holding that in your mind and seeing that that is clearly the case. Now, I, I believe that I'm right in saying that everybody who is a Christian in any sense at all is prepared to believe that and to accept that. But, Here's the point at which the vital question arises. Is all that which we accept only true of the early church? Was it only meant to be true of the early church? Now that is the position which we've really got to deal with. There are many people who teach that. They say, of course, I accept the whole of that evidence. They may try even to water that down. I've known people do that. They've tried to explain away things that are clearly miraculous. The cloven tongues of fire and the speaking in other languages on the day of Pentecost. I've heard men in using the greatest ingenuity to try to explain it away by some knowledge which they've just received about some odd dialects and so on. Now, I'm not wasting my time with that kind of argument. I am dealing with people who say, of course I accept everything that I find in the New Testament. I'm sure it's historical that these things actually happened. But, isn't it the case that that really doesn't apply to us now? It was only meant then. Now, these are some of the arguments which they bring forward. They uh, tell us that uh, all this was really meant simply to convince the Jews. Now, this is the argument that one finds particularly frequently in the writings of people who are called brethren, Plymouth brethren. This is their favorite argument. You get it in the writing of a man like Sir Robert Anderson, and there are many others who've repeated the argument, and they're doing it today in various pamphlets and booklets. They say this was purely a matter of a sign for the Jews. The Jews were unbelieving. Our Lord gives that answer to John the Baptist. John was a typical Jew. And our Lord says to him, look here, the signs that were prophesied are taking place. There's your answer. And they go so far as to say, therefore, that all these signs and miracles in the New Testament period were solely designed 
to appeal to the Jews and to convince them. I was reading one of these quite recently, which actually says this, that after our Lord's own failure in his teaching, he came to found the kingdom and he hoped he'd persuade them, but he didn't succeed, they put him to death. Well, then there was a kind of afterthought, the church comes in. And they say, then he made his last effort in the day of Pentecost and in the sending of this miraculous power amongst the apostles. It was the final appeal to the Jew. Now that's the kind of thing which they teach. And so when they come uh, to those people we looked at uh, weeks back in the 19th chapter of Acts, those disciples that Paul came across at Ephesus, you remember, and to whom he put the question, did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believed? They say, of course, these again were obviously Jews. But there's not a word to say that. Not a word. But in order to fit into the theory, they have to say, these were Jews, though they lived in Ephesus, and so on. Whereas most authorities are agreed that these people were almost uh, certainly people who had some connection with Alexandria in Egypt, and so on. Certainly that was the case, as we know, with regard to Apollos. However, they don't hesitate to say quite dogmatically that these people were Jews. Therefore, they spoke in tongues. Paul gave them this particular sign in order to answer them as Jews. Now, that's a very common argument. Then another way in which the argument is put is this. It says, yes, of course, those things happened then. But they happened then because it was the beginning of the Christian church. And God, uh, to set off the Christian church, as it were, did the unusual to give it a start. They say, uh, you get that in the same kind of thing in the Old Testament, at the beginning of the great line of prophets, in Elijah and Elisha, you read that they worked certain miracles. This was the start of the line of prophets. They say, you always tend to get this sort of thing at the beginning of a work. But, of course, you don't expect it to go on. It's like a father setting up his son. Gives him a farm, gives him a business, puts a sum of money in the bank for him. Now then he says, get on with it. He doesn't go on giving him these gifts. He sets him on. Something unusual and exceptional at the beginning of a, a great work. So they say, yes, this did happen, but it was only meant for the beginning of the dispensation. Then another argument is this one. That uh, these things uh, happen, these signs were given and these unusual powers and manifestations only until the New Testament canon should have been completed. You see the argument. They say at the beginning, of course, they hadn't got the New Testament epistles. We've got them. We've got the full truth put before us here and we can read it and study it and expound it and understand it. But, of course, in the early church they hadn't got that. So then... God gave revelations to the apostles and to prophets and to certain other peoples at certain times. They were dependent upon this direct message and teaching. But, of course, they say, the moment we were given, they were given, the church was given the scriptures, all that is no longer necessary. We've got the truth. So you don't need anything of the miraculous or the supernatural. Now, they're particularly fond of arguing that point uh, in terms of the uh, first epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 13. One of them actually puts it like this. After the scriptures were completed, these supernatural signs ceased. He makes a dogmatic pronouncement. And they, he, he says they ceased because they were no longer necessary once we had the scriptures. Now, this is the argument which they tried to put, put forward. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 from verse 8 of them, Charity never faileth, but whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether they be tongues, they shall cease. Whether they be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And that which is perfect, you see, is the giving of the Scriptures, the New Testament Scriptures. That which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, 
I put away childish things such as prophecy and speaking in tongues and miracles and things like that. I put away childish things. They, they actually say this in print. I could read it to you. That's the childish things that were put away. And now, since we've got the scriptures, we've got that which is perfect. For now, he goes on, we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. That's when you get the scriptures. Face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. Now they say, all oh, that means this, that until the scriptures came, it was all very partial. And the apostle, they say, is there saying quite clearly that all this partial, all these supernatural manifestations and so on, belong to the realm of childish things which are to vanish away when the perfection and the fullness comes and it did come when the New Testament canon was completed and added to this they produce a subsidiary argument they go so far as to say this they say you know even in the New Testament itself you've got clear evidence that these things were already passing away what's the evidence? well they say the fact that Paul couldn't heal Timothy and has to tell him to take a little wine for his stomach's sake that Trophimus was left sick and ill at Trophimus. Trophimus was left sick and ill at Melita, and that Gaius was not healed, and that Epaphroditus was desperately ill, nigh unto death, but that the Lord had had mercy upon him, and that he'd got well again. They say, therefore, you see, even in the New Testament itself, you see these things passing away, starting on the day of Pentecost in great fullness, but gradually disappearing as you go on in the New Testament. And uh, so they come to a final conclusion, which they state with the utmost confidence and dogmatism, that after the coming of the New Testament canon, all these gifts were entirely withdrawn. Now, there is some of the argument that is being put forward at the present time, and has been put forward very largely during this present century. Now, I must deal with this. I can't deal with it all this morning, unfortunately. I've stated the case to you. Let me just answer by giving give you one answer this morning. The first is this. The scriptures never anywhere say that these things were only temporary. Never. There is no such statement anywhere. Ah, oh, but says somebody, what about what you've read from 1 Corinthians 10? Well, I would have thought that that is a sufficient answer in and of itself to this particular criticism. You see what uh, we are asked uh, to believe on that kind of exposition. We are told that the coming of the New Testament scriptures puts us into a place of perfection. Actually, it says this in verse 12, For now, that's the apostle and others, he puts himself in, we see. The apostle is included with all other Christian believers. Before the New Testament canon had been completed, so much of which was written by Paul himself, we are told now we see through a glass darkly. But then, when the scriptures have come and are completed, face to face, now I know in part, but then, which they say means the completion of the scriptures, shall I know even as also I am known. You see what that involves. It means this, that you and I, who have the scriptures open before us, know much more than the Apostle Paul did of God's truth and of Christian truth. That's what it means. Nothing else at all, if that argument is correct. It means that we are altogether superior to the early church and even to the apostles themselves, including the apostle Paul. It not only means that, it means this. That we now are in a position that we know face to face. That we now, having the scriptures, have this knowledge that we know even as also we are known by God. Sure, it's unnecessary to say any more. What the apostle is dealing with in 1 Corinthians 
is the contrast between the highest and the best that the Christian can ever know in this world and in this life and what he will know in the glory everlasting. That's the contrast. The now and the then are not the time before the scriptures were given and after because that, as I say, puts us in a position entirely superior to the apostles and prophets who are the foundation of the Christian church and on whose very work we have to rely. It's inconsistent, it's contradictory. Indeed, there's only one word to use. It is nonsense. The then is the glory everlasting. It is only then that I shall know, even as also I am known. For then we shall see him as he is. It will be direct. It will be face to face. No longer, as he puts it, again in 2 Corinthians 3.18, no longer as an image, as it were, as a reflection but direct, absolute knowledge, perfect knowledge, full knowledge. That's the contrast that is in 1 Corinthians 13. The implications of the other exposition are just ridiculous. False to experience, false to the teaching of the whole of the New Testament at the same time. So you see the difficulties men lend themselves in when they dislike something and can't fully understand it and try to explain it away. No, no, all things must be judged in the light of the Scripture and we mustn't twist the Scriptures to suit our theory or our argument, whatever it may be. So I leave it this morning with this general statement that there is nothing in the Scripture itself saying that these things are to end. And further, every attempt to make the Scriptures say that leads to the same dismal, impossible conclusions that we have already seen in the case of 1 Corinthians 13. Now, God willing, we shall have to go on with this next Sunday morning. My friends, this is to me one of the most urgent matters at this hour. With the church as she is, with the world as it is, the greatest need is the power of God through his Spirit in the church that we may testify not even to the power of the Spirit, but to the glory and the praise of the one and only Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord, Son of God, Son of Men. Amen. Now our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 239, 239. Ye that do your master's will, meek in heart, be meeker still. 239. from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and ever and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide and continue with us now throughout the remainder of this our short, uncertain, earthly life and pilgrimage, and until we shall see his glorious face. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. 
All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.